IGCSE biologists, and I'm talking about those of you taking at Excel, let's have a quick chat about the discuss, evaluate, comment on type questions, which I know are stressing people out because they tend to be worth between five to six marks. What you're really wanting to do here, I know I'm generalizing, but I, but I tend to find this helps a lot, is you want to say reasons as to why you agree with a particular statement, reasons as to why you might disagree with a particular statement. On the whole, you don't have to provide a conclusion unless they explicitly ask for it. And then you also want to comment on the experimental detail provided in many of these types of questions. And I will show you some examples. So when I mention experimental details, you want to talk about the reliability of the experiment. That could be a good or bad thing, depending on how the experiment's been carried out. So have they looked at a large sample size or a small sample size? Larger obviously being better than small. It could be a location. I saw one question about some people in Australia. And so obviously the fact that only one country was tested means that it's not a particularly valid experiment. Consider if there's any details provided. If, it, for example, it's a question relating to humans, uh, any details about the human's age, gender, diet, etc. Obviously it totally depends on the question being asked, but these are the sorts of things you want to be considering. So here's a difficult question. Lipase inhibitors are chemicals that bind to lipase enzymes. To test the effect of a lipase inhibitor, equal masses of full fat milk are placed into two test tubes. Lipase inhibitors added to one test tube. Lipase is added to both test tubes and the pH of each solution is measured every five minutes. The results are shown in the table. Just remember to make a note that lipase is an enzyme responsible for digesting lipids or fats into fatty acids and glycerol. Calculate the mean rate of pH change per minute of this solution without lipase inhibitor. So we're looking along this column. Our experiment is carried out over 20 minutes. We want to look at the difference between these two values. Divide it by the number of minutes to get a rate of pH change per minute to get 0.11 as our answer. Explain the difference in the changes of pH of the solutions in the two test tubes during the 20 minute period. So changes in pH, remember pH relates to how acidic or alkali something is. So as we look at all the data, without the lipase inhibitor, so that's when the lipase is working normally, we see a drop in pH from eight to 5.8, whereas with the lipase inhibitor, the pH remains fairly constant. So what could account for this drop in pH? Well, I've already written that lipase digests lipids into fatty acids and glycerol. So fatty acids have a low pH because they're acidic, hence that drop there that we see to 5.8. So without lipase inhibitor, the pH falls faster. Let's say why? Due to lipids being digested into fatty acids. And it's those fatty acids which have a low pH. Doctors use this method to investigate the use of lipase inhibitor as a treatment for obesity. Give three volunteers a tablet containing the lipase inhibitor. Give another three volunteers a tablet with no lipase inhibitor. So straight away I'm gonna make a comment which is it's a very small sample. Only six people. Give all the volunteers 100 centimetres cubed of olive oil to drink. How unpleasant. Measure the lipid concentrations in the blood of the volunteers after three hours. Some of the volunteers reported abdominal pains after drinking the olive oil. Okay, that's really nasty. But that doesn't actually relate to the experiment in terms of whether inhibitor or no inhibitor has been given. The table shows the doctor's results. Let's just pick through them. So here we can see with the inhibitor that the blood, despite the fact that they've eaten that olive oil or they've drunk that olive oil, 
that lipid concentration hasn't really gone up too much compared with no inhibitor where it's vastly increased, meaning more lipids have entered the blood. But abdominal pains have been caused occasionally with the use of an inhibitor. But again, no inhibitor, we still have some abdominal pains. Discuss the use of the lipase inhibitor as a treatment for obesity. Use the data from the table to support your answer. And here's that meaty five marker, which some people really won't enjoy. So with this discussed question, we are going to decide, is the lipase inhibitor a good treatment for obesity? That's effectively the question we're being asked. Reasons... And we're going to say yes, and we're going to say reasons as to why we think no. So looking at the data, we can see, yeah, points supporting the use of the lipase inhibitor is that there's lower blood lipid concentration with use of inhibitor. That means with. So that means less fat is likely to be absorbed and less fat deposited around the body. So you're going to lower your risk of obesity. But notice this person down here didn't take the inhibitor, but their blood lipid levels still remain quite low. So that's not, you know, total evidence that it's the inhibitor that's responsible for the low blood lipid concentration. So I'm going to say, but one person who didn't take still had low blood lipid concentrations. We've already said some people suffered side effects. And actually, I've written quite a few notes and they're quite detailed, so I'm actually going to steal this as my answer. And now I want to make a comment on the investigation itself. I'm going to point out, but we can't draw a valid conclusion because a very small sample size was used. We know nothing about the age, sex, health of the various volunteers, and we don't know anything about their diet, which would obviously have a huge effect on obesity levels. So I'm going to say it's difficult to draw a valid conclusion because the sample size is very small. No information is provided on volunteer ages, sex, diet, levels of activity and I'm therefore confident I've provided a really nice answer to guarantee myself five marks. Now let's look at another example. Large quantities of food are wasted every year. Waste food needs to be disposed of using methods that do not harm the environment. The table shows the mass of each gas released into the air from three different methods of waste disposal. We have an anaerobic digester, so one which doesn't use oxygen. We've got bearing in landfill and we have burning. Let's pick through some of this data. So burying in landfill and burning are an absolute nightmare because they release lots of CO2, which causes global warming. In terms of carbon monoxide levels, burying in landfill is dreadful. Look, 0 0.6 carbon monoxide, remember, is toxic because it stops hemoglobin transporting oxygen around the body. What about methane burying in landfill? Again, a nightmare, and methane is responsible for global warming again. And then as we move along to the final column, when we consider sulfur dioxide, we can see that the anaerobic digester produces the most sulfur dioxide, and remember, sulfur dioxide is responsible for causing acid rain, so that's a big no-no. Calculate how much carbon dioxide would be released from 125 kg of waste food when using an anaerobic digester. In order to solve this, we take the 125 kilograms of waste food, we divide it by the 1,000 given in the question to get 0 0.125, and then you multiply it by the mass given in the question for CO2. So that gives us an answer of 4.6 kilograms of CO2 released from 125 kilograms of waste food. 
Some scientists have claimed that anaerobic digesters are the most environmentally friendly method of waste disposal. Evaluate this claim using data from the table and your own knowledge. Okay, well, first of all, the most environmentally method. We can't make that statement because it's too sweeping because we only compared three waste disposal methods. If you also look, it only looked at four waste gases in terms of pollutants. So this is us really looking at the experiment. And now we can really touch on the points that I made. So they're asking about the anaerobic digester. I'm going to say, yeah, it's better than bearing in landfill because it doesn't release as much carbon dioxide and methane, which are both greenhouse gases that contribute to global warming. So we're going to have less loss of biodiversity, less habitat loss, less flooding of low-lying land. But one big disadvantage is the fact that the anaerobic digester produces the most amount of sulfur dioxide, which, remember, contributes to acid rain. So we'll start by saying that anaerobic digesters release less methane and CO2 compared with bearing in landfill. Meaning less global warming, less polar ice caps melting, less loss of habitat. Looking back here, we can see that if you use the anaerobic digester, we have less carbon monoxide being released compared with bearing in landfill, which is a good thing because carbon monoxide, remember, is toxic. And then we'll round off our answer talking about the sulfur dioxide. These digesters also release less carbon monoxide which is toxic. But we're evaluating it, so we're giving the opposite argument. But the digesters release the most sulfur dioxide, which is responsible for causing acid rain, which damages trees and makes lakes too acidic. And then I'm just going to round off. It's difficult to fully evaluate the digester as being the most environmentally friendly because only three disposal methods and four types of waste gas were considered.